Chicanas who were in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee before I got involved with Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And she's a prolific writer. One of the books she wrote, the title of is Letters from Mississippi. And some people would say, what's a Chicana doing writing a book with the title Letters from Mississippi? But that's who Batita is. She's very serious about black brown solidarity. And while she was based in Mississippi and doing work there, uh, she was very into the struggle that people were engaged in. Um, and so I, I, I miss her. I miss being on panels with her, uh, miss going to jail. I went to jail with her daughter in New Mexico, Tessa, back in, uh, I think, 1968. We were there supporting Reyes Lopez Tejerina and the Alianza in New Mexico that was struggling to regain land that had been taken from the people by the US government, corporations, and so on. And we were there, actually, we went there to join with Tejerina as they celebrated a courthouse raid in northern New Mexico uh, that took place at a place called Tierra Maria. Uh, we went to, we got, we got taken at gunpoint by the New Mexican State Police. And uh, I must say that going to jail with Chicanos, with uh, other indigenous people, with members of the Brown Berets, it was a joyful experience. That may sound a bit shocking to some of you, but it's for us, it was going to jail was a good thing because when you went to jail, you could do more organizing and you had a captive audience, nobody was leaving. And uh, I, uh, I, I have fond memories of, of that experience. But I want to, uh, again, I just want to acknowledge Elizabeth Petita Martinez. I also want to acknowledge Ted Vincent, Theodore Vincent, uh, who lived uh, his last days in Berkeley, but he grew up in LA, went to Manual Arts High School. And many years ago, Ted Vincent, uh, and Ted Vincent's white, by the way, very, very, he was a very great guy. He was into uh, writing, studying, and writing about the work of uh, the Honorable Marcus Garvey. But Ted Vincent um, wrote some articles many years ago, and the title of them was The Blacks Who Freed Mexico. <laughs> I'll never remember, I'll never forget picking those articles up and how shocking, I, how shocked I was at the title. And I said, who are the Blacks who freed Mexico? Who, 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 who is it that Ted Benson is talking about? Eventually, I went up to Berkeley. I met with him. I sat down with him. He eventually published a book um, uh, called The Legacy of uh, Vicente Guerrero, Mexico's first Black Indian president. I used to argue with Ted, saying that the people in this part of the world are not Indians, and he shouldn't say that. But aside from the disagreements we had, uh, I learned a great deal from him. The last time I was to be meeting him was on a panel at the Oakland Museum and uh, he was undergoing open heart surgery. He didn't make it. Uh, so I want to acknowledge him because he's one of the early contributors to this understanding of black brown solidarity. And then the last person I want to acknowledge right now is Tony Gleaton. Tony Gleaton, who has also passed away joined the ancestors, was a black photographer who went to Costa Chica and other areas in Mexico uh, where black people live and photographed them. And he did some of the early work. And it was also in the early 90s that I had a chance to meet Tony Gleaton and interview him and so on, which uh, got me even more motivated to take the trip to Mexico. So I wanted to acknowledge them. And I want to say something else. I want to begin this presentation talking about the history of solidarity between black and brown. Um, and I wanna do it uh, chronologically. So I wanna start early on. And you see now this image of an Olmec head. The Olmecs uh, are acknowledged as the oldest civilization in the Americas, the oldest civilization in the Americas. This Olmec head that you see here, you can see clearly that it has a broad nose, which is very African, 
It has thick lips. Also on the head is a battle helmet. This was the helmet that was the Egyptian soldiers, which in 800 AD crossed from the African motherland and came west. The sea currents took them to the Gulf side of Mexico. And uh, it was there at La Venta where you found uh, they established with the Olmecs a ceremonial plaza where the Olmec heads were first uncovered. Uh, Egypt at that period in history was at war with Asia and Egyptian soldiers and sailors were out at sea looking for other places in the world where they might find tin and bronze to make weapons and, and armament. Uh, and so this, the, the currents though and the winds carried them to La Venta. I've been to La Venta. It's one thing to talk about places in the world. Uh, it's quite another to actually go. And so I'm always telling students, don't confine, don't be confined to the four walls in a classroom and just listen to an instructor. Go out in the world and visit these places and see for yourself uh, as I have. And so you see this image here. This is clearly an African image. We find that it was in this period of time, history shows that you had among the Olmec people, um, the first instances of pyramid building. You also had uh, the first instances of some deceased persons being buried standing erect and not just lying down. Uh, these were Egyptian practices just as the color purple, which was the color of the, the pyramids, the exterior of the pyramids, the Olmec heads themselves and other objects that were later uh, uncovered there in Mexico uh, had, but over time the, the color wore off. But I wanted you to see the Olmec heads. Some of them actually had, um, you could see the, the hair that was clearly African uh, and so on uh, with some of the heads. I went to uh, one of the museums and uh, photographed the old Mac head. I went to also went to Vir, Vir Hermosa where they have the outdoor museum. Uh, and aside, I think I mentioned that I went to, went to La Venta and up to the ceremonial plaza itself. So um, I say this too, to say and to make the point that the history of a very close relationship, the close relationship between Mexican and African people is not new. It's a very old relationship and it stretches back to at least 800 AD. So that's why I wanted to, uh, wanted you to see the uh, old Mac heads. We wanna come forward in history now. Uh, if we come forward, this is an in interesting image and many people in Mexico uh, when they learn history and study what has gone on. This, this, this um, sketch is known or referred to as the 33. These were 33 African men and women who in the, I believe in the late 1500s or early 1600s in an area uh, there in Veracruz fought against the Spaniards and in this instant, they, instance, they lost and 33 were captured and they were marched from Veracruz to Mexico City by the Spanish where they were beheaded and their heads were displayed on poles, which is something the Spaniards had a knack for doing. As you see here, uh, what's also important to know is that in 1609 at a place in Veracruz known today as Yanga, which is named for the African who escaped from his captors, developed a large following, and for some 38 years fought against the Spanish. He raided with his people, he raided Spanish haciendas, he attacked their, their mule trains, their supply trains, their, uh, and the Spaniards could not defeat him, and eventually they he, he set up a village, uh, a compound, which uh, 
had many runaways living there and uh, they carried on with, by the way, with the support of the indigenous population in the surrounding terrain in the hills and so on. They had uh, uh, quite a very extensive indigenous support to carry this on. Eventually the Spanish uh, established a treaty with Yanga uh, and he agreed to not take in any more runaways and they agreed to not continue to try to destroy this, uh, this liberated uh, village that he had created. Uh, many people don't think that Yanga uh, held up uh, with, to what he agreed to, which, which I would certainly support that he not have, he not have agreed to not have uh, conformed to the, the agreement. But anyway, this is Yanga, so he's very special. For a long time, uh, this village was called San Lorenzo de los Cruces. De los, I think it's De Las Cruces, but uh, in the 1930s, some Mexican university students that knew its true history insisted that it be renamed for Yanga, its founder, and so today it bears his name. Um, we want to move on. Um, this is a, a drawing from one of the books on the, on the Puebla, the Pueblo uh, revolt of 1680, which occurred in present day New Mexico. Um, the Pueblo indigenous people uh, had their own traditions. Um, the Spaniards came in and dominated them and controlled the area. In the 1670s, the Spaniards uh, executed and tortured uh, many of the spiritual leaders of the Pueblo people. Uh, one of their leaders, Pope, organized an uprising. So in 1680, on a, on a certain day, the, in, in all these villages that many of them were located near the Rio Grande, there in uh, the river, there in uh, New Mexico, the people rose up and they attacked the Spanish soldiers. They killed many of them, I should say most of them. Um, what's interesting about this uprising is uh, the history, most of the history is given of the 1980 uh, uprising, I'm uh, 1980, 1680 uprising, say that the Pueblos had support from black people. Um, and so in the accounts that I have looked at say that black people were involved. Um, this just shows uh, again, the people attacking the Spaniards. They burned down the Spaniards, uh, belittled, uh, dismissed the, uh, um, the beliefs, the um, spiritual beliefs and, and symbols and so on that the uh, Pueblo people had. And so the Pueblo people, when they uh, attacked the Spanish, they burned the, uh, the Catholic church, they burned the Bibles that the Catholics had bought, they ran the priest out and so on. And for a dozen years, they controlled this area until the Spanish eventually came back with more forces and were able to overcome them. But this was uh, a very important event, uh, the 1680, Pueblo revolt. I want to come forward now to the, the Mexican independence struggle and look at black and brown. Uh, I have put here uh, two images. One, the one on the right is Jose Maria Morelos, who became the leader of the main Mexican forces after um, the fall of um, its, uh, after the uh, struggle had begun. And uh, it, what's interesting here, you see in these images, it was Father Hidalgo who was a revolutionary priest who actually um, led the uh, beginning, and led at the beginning. Father Hidalgo lasted about nine months on the battlefield before he was captured and then executed by the Spaniards. Jose Morelos was one of his chief lieutenants. 
And he took up the leadership of the main Mexican army from that period. And for the next five years, he led it before he too was captured and executed. Why are these images here for you to see? These are rare paintings of Jose Morelos. And also you see on the left, Vicente Ramon Guerrero, who also led the Mexican army after the fall of Morelos. Vicente Guerrero, by the way, is the leader who led Mexico on through to independence. He's the one that is considered the consummator of independence and the one who dealt the final blow. What's interesting about these paintings is that you see both of these men are dark. They both have African roots. In fact, during the 11 year war from, for independence uh, from 1810 to 1821, you see um, the Mexican army was referred to as Ejercito Moreno or the dark army because it said that the complexion of so many of the fighters was dark. Many black people who had been enslaved and some were free, technically free, some had still been in chains. They rallied to the call to come and struggle for independence. Why? Because the leaders, beginning with Father Hidalgo at the beginning and then followed through with by Morelos and Guerrero, the leaders said that not only was it a struggle to secure independence for Mexico, but to also eliminate slavery and the caste system. And so black people really rallied to this. And uh, it said that the Mexican army carried a black flag onto the battlefield. The first flag of Mexico was black. It's not the flag that we see uh, hoisted over Mexico today. Um, and these were its leaders. Um, I think of, um, you know, I think of, Captain Jose Andres Carranza. He was a black captain in the Mexican army. He was very dark, very black. He, was, he became a hate object for the Spanish side because just before many of the battles that the Mexican forces would engage in with the Spanish, he would run to the front of the Mexican lines. He'd shout insults at the Spaniards. He'd call them names. He'd talk about their mama. They would shoot at him and he would dodge the bullets and run to the rear of the Mexican lines and then the battle would get under, underway. But that was on, uh, Jose Andres Carranza. So he's very special in this history of Mexico, but we hear nothing of him because we don't hear this history. We don't know this history. I've been in Mexico a number of times. I've went to Afro-Mexican dominated schools and Afro-Mexican dominated villages. Uh, and spoke through translation to students who had never heard this history, never heard it. One of the major battles during the 11 year war for independence is known as the siege of Cuautla. At Cuautla, some 300 Mexican forces occupied the low ground and they were up against, pitted against 20,000 Spanish forces who had better weapons, who had cannons as well. And uh, it's said that after some accounts say 58 days, other accounts say 72 days, that the Mexican forces were able to break through the siege and declare victory. And by the way, Jose Andres Carranza was there at that battle. But the battle, the Mexican forces were commanded by the two men you see, the two images you see here. Uh, General Guerrero and General Morelos, okay? Uh, this is very important because what it says is that Afro-Mexicans played a central role, I like to say pivotal role in helping secure Mexico's independence. The unfortunate thing is that many Mexican people today who are here in the United States as well as who are uh, there in Mexico know nothing of this history. They know nothing of this history. Uh, so they need to learn it just as black people need to learn it uh, and know the role that, uh, that was played there. In fact, Mexican forces 
were able to get their first cannons thanks to a revolutionary priest by the name of Jose, um, Jose Mercado. He was a revolutionary priest and he led a daring raid from Tepic to San Blas where they were able to take these cannons away from the Spanish and give them to the Mexican side. All these things happened. By the way, during the struggle for independence, most of the battles were fought in areas known as the Tierra Caliente, the hot lowlands. These were roughly uh, 50 miles wide and 150 miles long on both the Gulf side of Mexico and the Pacific coast side of Mexico. These areas were sparsely populated, but the people who lived there in the greatest numbers were Afro-Mexicans and they gave enormous support to the Mexican forces taking on the Spanish. In fact, in Veracruz, it said that for about four or five years, for a four to five year period or something like that, that because of the villages, a string of villages on the Veracruz side that was supporting the Mexican effort in the independence struggle, the Spanish, when they would dock their ships at Veracruz and send a runner to Mexico City, that uh, Black people would catch the runner, take them out, and so Spanish forces could not even get messages through to uh, Mexico City. So this was because of this enormous support. I wanna mention this other interesting point. Uh, near Acapulco, there on the Pacific side, you had uh, an event where a Spanish militia, it's called a Spanish militia, they were captured by Jose Morelos and the Mexican army. Um, and they were, when they were captured, they were forced to sit on the ground and General Morelos began to lecture them on uh, the importance of freedom for Mexican people. What's interesting is this Spanish militia, all the men in this militia were black. Now this may sound unusual, these are Afro-Mexicans and they were part of the Spanish militia. Here were Africans fighting for Spain fighting for the Spanish. That shouldn't strike anyone who's listening to me as unusual because we do it in this country. We got black men who fight for the US military, who went to Vietnam, who've gone to Korea, who've gone different places fighting for the military. And I always say to these men, I say, look, how could you fight for an army uh, against their so-called enemy when the leaders of that army, uh, not very long ago, sold your mom, would sell your mom. How are you gonna fight for them? So with the Vietnam War, when the Vietnam War was happening and I was a young man and I was forced to show up at the induction center, I went down, actually I went down with an arm load of Muhammad Speaks newspapers. That was the Muslim <laughs> paper at the time. I was talking crazy <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I told him, I said, you know, how am I gonna fight for you when you, uh, you enslaved my people? I said, if you give me a weapon, who do you think I'm gonna use it on? I have to watch how I talk on these things. But uh, if you give me a weapon, who do you think I'm gonna use it on? And I was saying, uh, I was saying to Brother McGowan earlier here, Brother Rob, I was saying, uh, you know, it's interesting because we found out with the Vietnam War that Ho Chi Minh, the leader of North Vietnam, was a, he was a merchant marine earlier on in his life. He used to travel from Asia across the world and he often he came to New York. He used to go to meetings that the Honorable Marcus Garvey had organized. And he heard Marcus Garvey say, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad, so Ho Chi Minh started saying Asia for the Asiatics. He learned that from, he learned to say that from going to Marcus Garvey meetings. And in the 1930s, we learned that Ho Chi Minh actually wrote an essay on lynching where he said black people in the United States were the most oppressed and exploited of the human family. This is Ho Chi Minh. 
And so we learned those things way back then. We had more sense, better sense than to join the military, join these terrorists, these people who were uh, part of the military in this country that have terrorized the world and still terrorize us today inside this country. So anyway, uh, I wanted to say all that. Oh, these men, getting back to my point that Jose Morelos was lecturing, some of them didn't want to hear what he had to say and they, they were disgusted and they turned their backs on him and started looking the other way. So he stepped over to his horse. He reached behind the saddle on his horse and he retrieved a branding iron and he got the branding iron and he came back and he waved it in the faces of these men. And he said, would you rather return to this or will you switch sides and join our forces? And the men looked at that branding iron. And they said, we will join you, we with you. <laughs> and so when I heard that story, I was, uh, I, I, I was very impressed. And I said, I'm going to repeat it. Every time I get a chance to open my mouth, I'm going to repeat this story. And so I'm telling you the story of it. Jose Morelos, as I said, he lasted about five years before he too was captured and executed. And then you had Guerrero take up the leadership of the main Mexican army. Not only did Guerrero, Guerrero is very special because he not only saw the country through the independence, he was a mule driver uh, as a younger person, he did not have the benefit of education. And so he actually eventually became the head of Mexico. And he, uh, one of the things he did is he pushed for the creation of schools throughout the country. He wanted the Mexican population to be literate. And it's interesting because what is today? This is the 20, what is today's date? The 24th? Okay, on the four, just 10 days ago, the 14th of February, what was that? Most people, you go to these schools, I, I love to tell this story too, you go in the schools of this country, especially where they're black and brown students, and you say, what's February 14th mean to you? They say, oh, Valentine's Day. So right away, they're gonna, and I say, so what do you do? You write little love notes to somebody you love and give them chocolate and do that kind of stuff, and yes. I said, okay, if you're Italian, raise your hand. No hands go up, because these are black and brown students. You're not Italian, that comes out of the Italian culture, okay? But February 14th, 1831, is when Vicente Guerrero had been deceived and uh, went aboard a ship there, docked off the Mexican coast, and was taken captive. And, and it was February 14th, 1831, that he was executed. We should remember Guerrero. Why? Because not only was he African and Mexican, which helps us think about the unity of our, between the two peoples, but also because he pushed for the country, for all the people in the country of Mexico to be literate. He also outlawed slavery in the Mexican Republic in 1829. And so he's just very special. But because we don't know our history, February 14th comes and we don't think about Guerrero. We are going out around pretending to be Italian. You know, we do a lot of strange stuff. Speaking of holidays, important days, because we celebrate Thanksgiving, all right? You know, we celebrate all these things that make no sense at all. Um, we got March coming up and I'm gonna to get to that in a minute, but I, let me just say this, March 6, 1836 is when the Alamo fell in San Antonio, Texas. All them slaveholders, 200 plus white men who were slaveholders or would be slaveholders. Many of them were mercenaries who were promised that if they defeated the Mexican army, they were promised that they would get land, be paid, and in some cases, get slaves. So you had people there like Davy Crockett and uh, who was the other one? Jim Bowie with the Bowie knife, who was a big slave owner in Louisiana. He was a big Louisiana slave owner. Him and his brother used to 
by slaves from the pirate Lafitte uh, there at the port of New Orleans. And they would move enslaved people further north up the Mississippi and then across through the southern states. He had a big plantation there in Louisiana. And he had, it said that he even had slaves there in the Alamo. And by the way, I went to the Alamo. You got to do this. If you're going to learn this history and be serious about history and serious about struggle, you got to walk the talk. So I went to San Antonio, Texas. And I went to the Alamo. And uh, I should say, uh, don't just go to the Alamo. You got to go to Mi Tierra. Mi Tierra is the restaurants, the Mexican restaurants, about 10 miles away from the Alamo. Got some of the best chicken enchiladas. You got to go there and get you some chicken enchiladas. Don't just go down there to the damn Alamo. But I went into the, I went to the Alamo. You had a white woman taking all the people around inside the Alamo and uh, all these white people and some black people who were silly, who again, don't know the history. So the woman is talking about all these brave white men were here fighting against these uh, marauding Mexicans who, were, who eventually came over the wall and took them out. These brave white men were, these brave men were fighting for freedom and they were led by the 26 year old uh, Colonel William Travis. And then in the next sentence she says, and William Travis owned a slave named Joe. No, now here I am taking notes because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here not too poor to pay attention as we used to say in the neighborhood. Not too poor to pay attention. I say, how, how are these men brave and fighting for liberty in the first sentence? And then in the next sentence, one of them, the leader of the group, owns a slave named Joe. He's deprived somebody from liberty, from their liberty, of their liberty, but yet he's fighting for liberty. That's a contradiction, but you're, supposed, you're not supposed to pick up on that. So the, the people in the group, they're all excited and right with the woman and what she's saying. And I'm taking notes. I'm clear about what this is. So you have to understand that. I'm gonna come back to the Alamo, but I wanted to uh, kind of wrap up here uh, on the independence struggle. Um, and uh, later there might be some questions or, or comments about that, but uh, I wanted to get through that. Okay, so after independence, which is, uh, independence is attained in 1821, and then you need to know that around 1822, you had Stephen Austin, the son of Moses Austin, who was very uh, determined to uh, take the area we know as Tejas, Texas, away from Mexico. So he starts encouraging whites, especially whites from the deep south, to come from those states into Texas and uh, take control of certain areas and develop plantations. And many of these whites came with their slave property. One of them, Jared Gross, came with 90 enslaved people. Uh, and so this was in contravention of what Mexico saw. Mexico did not want uh, Mexico was against slavery. You need to understand, I want to make this very clear. Mexican people, even though there was slavery in Mexico for about 300 years under Spanish rule, the Mexican people were not the enslavers. The enslavers were the Spaniards. You need to be very clear about that. And so, so from 1821, 1822, you got Stephen Austin encouraging whites to come into Texas with their slave property. And this is creating real problems for the Mexican people and Mexican authorities. Um, and um, what's happening is that black people who are coming in chains into Texas are running away at every opportunity. They're rebelling at every opportunity. The Tejanos, which, are the, which is the term used for Mexicans in Texas, Texas Mexicans, Tejanos aided black people in many ways. They were very defiant. They, uh, 
they were helping uh, black people not only rise up against um, the whites on these plantations, um, take horses, uh, kill whites, do all that, but help black people escape. In fact, from 1822 until roughly 1855, thousands of black people um, ran away and ran deep into Mexico. In fact, uh, we're gonna we wanna get into that a little more. Um, oh, I need to say something. Oh, I, I, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, so the, you had these fearless Tejanos helping us. From 1822 into 1865, you need to know that the US authorities uh, being pushed by many of these white slaveholders trying to get Mexico to engage in uh, fugitive uh, slave uh, return runaways, return fugitive slaves and Mexico on an annual basis turned down the US continued refusing to turn over black people. Okay. Um, and they also uh, punished Tejanos in major ways, ran them off of jobs, uh, lynched them. We talk about the lynchings of black people, but we need to be very clear that many Mexican people have been lynched. In fact, there's a group, there's probably more than one group, but there's a some groups that are looking at the lynchings of Mexicans uh, that is probably way up in the thousands that we hear nothing about. So that's also something that was going on. Um, in fact, it's said that by the year 1855, whites feared that somewhere in the neighborhood of some 5,000 black people, enslaved black in the United States had escaped further into the South across, at that time now was a Texas Mexican border into Mexico and were uh, defended and fed and employed by Mexican people. Most black people in the United States as well as most uh, Mexican people know nothing of this history. And certainly when we talk about the Underground Railroad when we get a chance to, because this is the black month, right? February, we get a chance to talk about our history. We talk about the Underground Railroad and we talk about how uh, from the South to the North, uh, many, many enslaved black people uh, were aided and made their way North and many eventually ended up in Canada. But we never talk about the South to South connection. What about the South to South connection? Okay, and so, um, this too becomes very important. Um, it is something that we need, one needs to know. In fact, it's said that uh, for a time, the US deployed um, one fourth of its standing national army along the Mexican, uh, the Mexican uh, US border there in Texas uh, to try to prevent the, the Africans enslaved Africans in the US from running away. That's how serious it was. Uh, there's an a number of interesting articles I could mention. There's Across the Rio to Freedom, US Negroes in Mexico by Rosalie Swartz. Interesting article because in the piece, in her research, she pointed out that the, the Mexicans used to place rafts out in the river. They would tie them to a tree close to what was uh, the US side. This was after, of course, Mexico was taken by force. Uh, I mean, Texas was taken by force from Mexico and uh, became a part of the United States. The Mexicans tied these rafts out so that runaways could actually get on a raft and then get, get the rope and the rope was tied to a tree on the Mexican side. They pulled themselves across the river and so on. Um, but anyway, uh, this is history that one needs to know. There's also an interesting article called Border Love on the Rio Grande, African-American men and Latinas in the Rio Grande Valley, south of, Te of South Texas, 1850 to 1940. 
by a man named Rodriguez, Alberto Rodriguez. He talks about all the runaway black men that linked up with Latinas, with Mexicanas, and uh, form relationships and so on uh, during this period. Okay. Um, I wanted to come up, I was talking about the Alamo a little earlier, and I want to come back to the Alamo. Again, that was March 6, 1836. That should be a big day of celebration for Black people in this country. We should be running up to Mexicanos and Mexicanos, to the Chicanos in this country. We should be hugging them and thanking them for the great victory that they uh, uh, succeeded in in, uh, in destroying those whites at the Alamo, but we don't do it again because we don't know the history, as I said. It's interesting that that was March 6th. April 21st, that same year, Sam Houston, the uh, racist for which the city of Houston, Texas is named, who was also a big slave owner, he rallied many of the Texas settlers and they went, uh, they left and they actually surprised the Mexican army led by Santa Ana. It was uh, an attack that took place at night, as I understand. Many of the Mexican soldiers were trying to surrender. They were just shot down. Uh, Santa Ana himself was captured and he was forced as a captive to order all his forces to withdraw further south completely out of Texas into Mexico. So he gave that order. One of his generals, Brigadier General Jose Urea, I think we got an image of him here. Brigadier General Jose Urea uh, knew that Santa Ana, there he is, knew that Santa Ana had been forced to give the order. So he defied the order and he had his men fan out across Texas. They marched across Texas. They went from plantation to plantation. They questioned the titles that whites held to the land. And uh, they noticed Africans in chains who were enslaved on these plantations. And in many instances, General Urea and his men gave on the spot titles to those enslaved Africans. Okay, this is 1836. Now we learn in the history of this country, we've heard about 40 acres and a mule. A lot of us get excited, we don't know nothing about it, but we get excited, 40 acres and a mule. Uh, that was General Sherman uh, with field order 15 and General Howard uh, with another order. This was, this took place in 1865. This was at the end of the Civil War, the 40 acres and a mule. So a generation before that here, 1836, this Mexican general gave titles to land to our ancestors, but we've never heard of him. We know nothing of it. We know nothing of it. This, this is why it's so important to know history. It's important to relearn some history. Um, so I wanted to make that clear. Um, all right, so much for the Alamo. Now we wanna come on, moving ahead in history. We now come up to uh, 1846. The US ends up declaring war uh, on Mexico. Okay, they uh, declare war against Mexico because they want, uh, they want Mexico. Some, some, some actual, some US leaders, some whites who run in this country actually said, let's take all of Mexico. So in two years, the US military defeats Mexico. And by the way, many Mexican forces actually believe they could defeat the US. Uh, they were, there was a serious miscalculation, but I salute them for their courage and their bravery. They actually thought they could actually defeat the U.S. But the U.S., the numbers in the U.S. were uh, pretty high. There was a lot of people had settled here in this country. And the U.S. had, uh, in some ways, I, they had a, 
you know, uh, much better weapons and so on. So after two years, they take control of Mexico. We have here an image of Mexico. You see how large Mexico was. You see the rest of the United States. Look at this next image. This is what happens at the, in 1848. The United States ends up taking, after defeating Mexico, 55% of Mexico's most fertile land. In Mexican culture and in their history, they had a tradition of leaving the southern part of Mexico and coming further north because the most fertile lands were to the north and better job opportunities were to the north. So it's very, uh, it's not unusual for Mexican people to be moving north. Now, uh, most of their territory is taken after uh, a criminal war. And it's criminal, we have to say that's criminal. It's interesting because in the schools of the United States, in elementary school and then later on in secondary level schools, the teachers never tell you that it was a criminal act. You just accept, you just push to accept this idea that this is the United States. And the war was okay, it was a just war. That's the way they promote it. They don't even talk about the war. They don't talk about those two years and what happened. But some of the leaders in the US actually wanted, said at the end, let's take all of Mexico. Let's not even, let's not be satisfied with this. But we need to say that this was a criminal act. And so I'm certainly saying it and I don't back down, okay? Um, we wanna come on up. Um, who is this in this picture? This is Dred Scott. We're taught in history, when we get some history, that Dred Scott, of course, was an enslaved black man. His, uh, his owner was in, had him enslaved in Missouri, him and his wife. The owner took, uh, took them from Missouri uh, further north into Illinois and some other states that were considered free states. And they were there for a while and Dred Scott got this idea that he should sue for his freedom. He got some legal help. And the case ended up before the US Supreme Court. What did the uh, US Supreme Court say in its judgment? It said that you still a slave and black people have no rights that whites are bound to expect to respect. This is 1857. Keep that year in mind. 1857 was the same year in Mexico that the Mexican Congress adopted Article 13, which declared that any enslaved person that sets foot on Mexican soil is from that moment free. This is the contrast between two nations here in Mexico, which had a, already a long and established tradition of welcoming, accepting runaway Africans, running away, had run away from slave in the United States and Mexico. Now they actually uh, pass a law, uh, making that very clear after year after year, refusing to enter into fugitive slave agreements with the United States, okay? So I um, wanna point that out. I put this here to remind me to talk about Cinco de Mayo, because of course that's a holiday that's uh, for many people here in this country. Um, and usually when Cinco de Mayo takes place, Many of us who are black, we uh, kind of fold our hands and we take a back seat, we step back and we say, this is a holiday for Mexican people. It's got nothing to do with me. But I say, no, it's got everything to do with us. Why? Because 1862, uh, May 5th, 1862, when the Mexican forces defeated French invaders, they were at Puebla and I've gone to Puebla, I've gone to the fort, I looked from the walls of the fort out beyond. I wanted to get a sense of the battle. The French army was considered one of the best armies of that day. And here they were defeated by Mexican forces who came from behind the walls of the two forts and actually chased the French. We don't, we don't hear that part, but they actually chased the French after defeating them. Um, what we need to know about that is that the French 
who invaded Mexico were also supporters of the Confederacy because in this country, the Civil War was taking place, 1861 to 1865. And the uh, French had hoped that a Confederate victory over the North would allow them to regain some lost footing here in the Western Hemisphere. So that's why the French supported the Confederacy. So their defeat was a blow to slaveholders. And therefore, on May 5th every year, the Blacks who live in this country need to run up to Mexican people and again thank them for defeating some people who upheld slavery and wanted to see slavery extended. But we don't do it because we're not taught that. What's interesting is another interesting point. Just before 1862, the year before 1861, um, Robert Toombs, Robert Toombs was the, uh, what was he called? He was his, he had a term. He was the, uh, he was the, a top leader of the Confederacy. And he sent a man named John Pickett to Mexico City to negotiate with Benito Juarez, who headed the Mexican government and other Mexican authorities. They wanted the Mexican government to allow them to ship slave produced cotton from the US South overland to Mexican ports and then it'd be shipped to European nations and others so that the Confederates could get money to continue the war effort. So John Pickett as a, thank you, <laughs> thank you for helping me, uh, sent, uh, so, so anyway, here John Pickett is, he goes to see Benito Juarez, and why did, why did they need the, the slave produced cotton in the US South shipped over them? They needed it shipped over them because the Union forces had blockaded Southern ports. Um, when Benito Juarez hears what Pickett is asking for, he says, no. He says, we don't support slavery. And so you're not, you can't do that. John Pickett, very disappointed. He hangs around Mexico City, hoping he can change the, the minds of the officials. And one day he's out on the street. He runs into this uh, Mexicano and they get into an argument over, the, over slavery. And uh, they get into a physical fight. The Mexicano knocks John Pickett to the ground and Mexican officials come and they arrest Pickett and put him in jail. He's in jail for some days and eventually he gets released and uh, he makes his way back to the South. And of course, he's coming, coming with disappointing news for the Confederate leadership. When I heard this story, I jumped with joy. I'm excited because my forebears were enslaved. My mother, one of the reasons I struggled so hard, my mother was born in Calvert, Texas. My, first of all, let me say this about my family. One of the, uh, the oldest member on the family tree, and I just learned this recently because I went to a family reunion. Her name was Harriet. And she, uh, she was owned by a man uh, in Culpeper County, Virginia. And a few years before the Civil War, this man put her and five children, I think they were her children, on a wagon and left Culpeper County, Virginia and went to Texas. Um, and uh, that's the family sprouted from there uh, and so on. But, Eventually my mother, and his name was Richards, so she had the name Richards. Uh, I went to a family reunion uh, for the first time in Texas in 2019. Went to a family reunion there. 
And I uh, promised my cousin I wouldn't be critical of some of the older men there. These men would kind of come to the reunion. They had it in a, uh, what it is, uh, VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars building. That's where they had a reunion. They had a flag all draped outside. And these other men who were older like me had on caps, veteran caps from Vietnam, and Korea and stuff. I promised my cousin I wouldn't criticize anybody and, and embarrass her. But this is where I began to learn family history. But I learned something else earlier on in life when I was much younger. My mother, who was born nearby in Calvert, Texas, um, in the colored school, which she attended, they used to come and take her out of the classroom on a regular basis to the cotton field and have her chop cotton. She used to tell us, me and my other siblings, those stories when we were young. And that's why I struggle as hard as I do because she's the ancestor that I have the greatest love for. And uh, I don't like the way my mother was treated and the stuff that they put her through. Um, why did I get off on that? But um, I, uh, anyway, let me just say that's, that has a lot to do with why I struggle. Um, but coming back to this uh, thing with, uh, with Cinco de Mayo, after the Mexican army defeated the French that following year, 1863, Napoleon III, uh, who had sent those French forces and they, oh, not, I'm going too fast. Actually a few months after um, that May 5th victory, um, the French came in with greater numbers and took control of Mexico and under Napoleon III, they ran Mexico. Uh, it was Napoleon III who oversaw the transshipment of 20,000 infield rifles and a lot of ammunition across from that point in time now, the uh, Mexican-Texas border to the Confederates, because Texas was a Confederate state, to those Confederates in Texas to carry on the war. Uh, we should also know, of course, the Civil War was not fought over slavery. It was fought because you had a disagreement between whites in the North and whites in the South as to how this territory to the West that had been taken from Mexico was to be developed. The whites in the South wanted to go with and have established plantations with free labor. Whites in the North wanted to be able to go West and get land themselves, or if not get land themselves, to be able to work and be paid labor. And they would, couldn't compete with the, the outlook of the South. And that's why the war was fought. So slavery had to be ended uh, in order for the North to get its way. But if slavery war was, you know, we need to be very clear about that. Okay, let's move on. Um, now we come up to the uh, Mexican Revolution, what's called the Mexican Revolution, 1910 to 1920. And this is an interesting photograph. It shows Emiliano Zapata, the great general from the South. Zapata is the one who said, seek justice from uh, tyrannical governments, not with a hat in your hand, but with a rifle in your fist. You see in the picture here, he's very dark. Zapata had African roots. I've been to his hometown there in Anacuilco, there in Mexico. Um, and so he had African roots. And that's something else we need to understand about this, this uh, whole uh, phenomenon of black brown solidarity. I think we've got another image we can go to. You'll see uh, that, that of course is the same. This is one of the articles I wrote, but here, these are two of his sisters. And one of them you see, the one on the left, Maria Luz, she's darker than I am. This is, these are two of Zapata's sisters. And then there are other photographs of Zapata that one can look at. Uh, these are, these other photographs you look at here, these are Afro-Mexicans. Many of them fought on the side of Zapata uh, <clears throat> during the revolution, which was fought for land and justice. You see they were black. They were Afro-Mexicans. It's interesting, when I was with Baji, we had come from further south in uh, Arizona and we come back up through Tucson and we were in Phoenix. 
we went to this community museum there and they had, uh, I went inside and a number of us were on a bus and I came back and got on the bus and Emory Douglas, who was Minister of Culture in the Black Panther Party, very good friend. When I got back on the bus, Emory looked at me and he said, did you go in that room to the left all the way in the back? And I said, no. He said, you need to get off the bus and go back and go in that room because there's something there I know you'd be interested in because he knows my interest in this solidarity. And I, I listened to Emory and got off the bus and went back. And that's where I saw these images. There were a lot more that I had, but here you see, these are black soldiers. Many of them, again, rode with Zapata. If you go forward with the next image, keep going. This is Colonel Carmen Amelia, uh, what's her last name? But anyway, she was a Colonel. She rode with Zapata. And uh, she's got a pistol there in her pocket. Sometimes the women look at her and say, that a woman? Yes, woman. Don't women wear pants? Yes, she got on pants, you know? They say she used to fire that pistol with her right hand and puff on the cigar with the left. But she goes with Zapata. And uh, so I was very uh, astonished uh, to see this. Not totally amazed, but uh, it just, it, it's very surprising because, again, many Mexicanos don't know that there were Afro Mexicans during the independence struggle. So I, uh, I wanted, to, uh, wanted to get to that. Also, during the independence struggle, look at this, look at this image. That's some serious solidarity there. <laughs> no, no further comment needed, but that's some serious, that's serious there. Okay. Now let's come forward. Also during the Mexican Revolution, which of course was a 10-year period, in the middle of that, you had 1915, you had the plan of San Diego. What was that? These were some very radical Mexicanos that developed uh, a document, Revolutionary Manifesto, that said Mexico, that they were about taking back the Southwest from the United States, taking it back from Mexico. They uh, encouraged black people to join their forces and help them. But what they also said is that they were gonna give black people in the United States some of the territory that they took back. They said they were going to, they wanted to eliminate all white males 16 years old and older. And this upset a lot of whites, as you could imagine. And they went looking on a witch hunt, looking for uh, Mexicanos. They lynched a lot of Me Mexicanos. Many Mexicanos were fleeing Mexico, coming north across the border into Texas as a refuge, and the whites would get them. And, uh, and lynch them and the rest. So one needs to know that. Uh, but let's go forward. Now, we, we're getting down near the end of this, but um, you know, it, people who are into sports like to think that it was Jackie Robinson that led the effort to desegregate the major leagues in this country, major league baseball. Uh, it wasn't Jackie Robinson. And I went out uh, years ago and I went and bought me a bootleg copy of 42 on the street, took it home and put it in my thing to watch. I was real excited. I got real excited because I said, I'm going to see, I'm going to see how uh, Jackie Robinson, I'm going to not so much how what Jackie Robinson did, but I'm going to get to hear about how Mexicanos led the effort to desegregate the major leagues in this country. The Mexicanos are like the elephant in the room. They played the major role, but Mexico was never once mentioned in the film. But it was Jorge, uh, Jorge Velasquez, I think his last name was, uh, who actually hired, um, he actually, no, Jorge, it was Jorge, Jorge Pascal, who in 1938 hired Satchel Page. Satchel Page in the, uh, the colored uh, baseball, um, colored leagues, Negro, what they call the Negro leagues. Satchel Page was rumored to be the best pitcher. So he hired Satchel Page so that the Mexican leagues could begin to defeat, have a better chance at defeating the US leagues. He also had several other uh, top players from the Negro Leagues. 
And so they started winning. This was 1938. So in 1947, what does the U.S. do? They hire Jackie Robinson for the Brooklyn Dodgers and bring in other Blacks. And that's how they began to reverse this trend of Mexico defeating them. But it was the Mexicans that brought about the desegregation of the major leagues. And so it's important that we know this, okay? Um, moving on. Yes, yes. Carmen Amelia Robles, <laughs> that was the uh, colonel that uh, fought under Zapata, okay? All right, here we have who? We have Diego Rivera, who was, uh, of course, married to Frida Kahlo, uh, very popular in Mexican history, uh, but also uh, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo uh, had a lot of people who had problems with them because they were socialists, they were communists, but also Diego Rivera had African roots. And if you look at this image, you see the lips, you see the kinky hair, and the dark skin. Uh, there's a school here in LA, a high school named for Diego Rivera. And I bet nobody at that school, the teachers there, admits that he was African. But he was probably the greatest muralist uh, to have lived uh, and so on. Um, in fact, in the 1920s, 1930s, you had black artists from the US um, you had Charles White, you had uh, John Biggers, Elizabeth Catlett, and others go to the Mexican art school and learn from Rivera and Orozco and Siqueiros, the Mexican style of producing murals and connecting racial struggles and labor struggles to the imagery. Uh, Elizabeth Catlett stayed there and married a Mexicano and stayed and she just died of course a few years ago too. So now we're gonna move on. Here's Elizabeth Catlett. Okay, wanna come up now to, uh, we're gonna to get to this one in a minute, but I wanted to mention the, uh, I wanted to mention 1943 because you had uh, 1943, of course, the second world war was being fought and uh, you had uh, sailors and Marines in the US armed forces who had real problems with, um, brown and black people. There was a period when uh, the zoot suits were being worn and uh, they have a, they refer to some instances where there were conflicts between US military people and Chicanos and blacks who were wearing suit suit, zoot suits as the zoot suit riots. They were not no riot. These were white uh, supremacists attacking people of color Many of the whites in the uniform of the U.S. were resentful of men of color who were not, who were dodging the draft as they should have, dodging uh, going into the U.S. serving in the military. So they put out, a, this is an article from the L.A. Times um, pointing out that in 1943, you had uh, much of the black population concentrated at 12th Street and Central Avenue in L.A and the whites at the Long Beach Naval Base said they were going to come down and kick the ends behinds uh, on a given day. Uh, Chicanos from Clanton and Hardeen and Jugtown, uh, all these other neighborhoods who were referred to as gangs by the system, they said, we got your back. And an arrangement was made where Many black people went and picked up a lot of their homies and brought them to 12th and Central and they hid in the alleyways and on the side streets. And when the Naval people and the white Marines came down, they had some decoys in the street that ran out after these blacks at 12th and Central. And the time says 500 Chicano gang members from various Chicano gangs came out and jumped on the white sailors and the Marines and whooped them and ran them out and the US military issued an order that the US servicemen were to stay clear of Los Angeles after that. Uh, well, again, these are instances of black and brown solidarity, some serious stuff. Now we want to go back to that other image we were looking at. This is one of the zoot suitors, Cesar Chavez. He was actually a zoot suitor before he uh, became a labor organizer and leader of UFW. Did a lot of great stuff, but he also made some mistakes. Uh, 
he was very much against uh, the undocumented. They used to call immigration on the undocumented. People don't know that about the state of child is. But I met the man, we met at the airport one day and we embraced each other. I, I told him how many of us have supported the grave strike and continue to support the UFW. But one of the greatest achievements of UFW was in 1974, they uh, had a uh, strike against, uh, who is it? Minute Maid in Florida. Minute Maid is owned by, I think, oh, Coca-Cola. I think Coca-Cola owns Minute Maid, if I'm not sure, I'm not mistaken. Um, and they, uh, they actually secured an agreement and it was secured by the Florida State Director for UFW. His name was Mac Lyons. Mac Lyons was a brother, black man, who grew up in Texas, worked the fields. He's passed on now, but a beautiful brother. I met him coming out of jail. I was in, coming out of jail again in Georgia after fighting some blacks who ran a place called New Communities in Southwest Georgia, were mistreating the black labor force. And we had called on UFW uh, to come up and help us organize a chapter and so on. And he met me coming out of jail. Uh, but anyway, um, this is again some of the solidarity between the uh, between the two groups. I wanted to mention a few other things. Oh, yeah, this is interesting. When there are some hassles between black and brown people, you got uh, a lot of whites that exaggerate it. You have a, a site, a website called. American Renaissance, and uh, whenever there's a squabble in a prison yard or on a high school campus between black and brown, they publish a lot of stuff. One of the things they say, here, here, I mean, here's a quote, the conflict between minorities is truly the great white hope. A more satisfying predicament, I can't envision. The two dominant and problematic minorities fighting each other, absolutely delicious, may it never end. This is stuff white people put out. They say when the burritos wage war against the chitlins, only the hamburger will remain on the plate. This is what white people, this is stuff they be putting out when we squabble with each other, okay? The other thing I wanted to point out, and I meant to say this at the beginning of this presentation, they pointed out in 2007, the US Census Bureau pointed out that there are 3,141 counties that make up the continental United States. 303 of those counties now is majority people of color. That's mostly black and brown, mostly Mexican, Me Mexican and black. And what the white supremacists and many white people period fear is that we'll come to know this history. Once we get know this history between ourselves, how in the worst of times we aided or defended one another, we will come together and we'll be able to push for better jobs, uh, increased pay, uh, more of us having access to higher education, all this stuff. And that means some group is gonna have to get by with less. Which group is that? That's the white group. And that's their fear and that has a lot to do with why whites push to keep us divided. And so I wanted to uh, point that out as I kind of wind down here, maybe I should, uh, Oh, I want to say something else very important before I, the Afro-Mexicans in Mexico uh, were just allowed in 2015 the right on the Mexican census to identify as Afro-Mexican because they've been ignored. And as I said, they're very impoverished and so on. And it's very important that we be aware of them, that we go down more of us and connect with them and that we find ways to support them and we also put pressure on the Mexican government to assist them. I lived in Belize for a number of years, um, just back now, a few years. And when I was in Belize, I did an exhibit, an Afro-Mexican exhibit uh, there in Belize City. And I forced the Mexican embassy to co-sponsor the exhibit. Why? Because they have tried, they're part of the effort to make us invisible in Mexico. I forced them. And many of the Belizeans who came to see the exhibit were surprised because they go up, when they go up to Belize, Mexico is on their northern border. And when they cross into Belize, they go up on the side where Cancun and all of this, they go up through Quintana Roo. 
There are no black people there. There are no Afro Mexicans. So, so they were shocked to find, to, to learn that they are Afro Mexicans. And they were talking about how many of the images that I had resembled their family members and so on. So as, as the beat goes. But anyway, I, I think I should wrap up at this point and uh, give others a chance to make comment and uh, question anything that I've said. These are some more images there. Yeah. We also had a group that uh, some years ago, uh, my ex, uh, Joyce Jermaine Watts, we, uh, we co-sponsored uh, this group, African and Latino Youth Summit. So we had black youth and, and uh, mostly Chicanos and Chicanas from LA high schools, Santa Monica, uh, come together and have retreats and discuss this very history that I'm sharing with you all today. And that it lasted for a while. We even took students to uh, Black Mexico, as we call it, to down to Costa Chica, and they had a chance to, they had a great experience there. So yes, these are some of the, this is one of my images there from, uh, from Pino Tepa, Nacional, one of the towns there in Costa Chica. Okay. And thank you. Thanks everyone for your patience and for your tolerance. <laughs> All right, so, uh, oh my goodness. Thank you, Mary. So, so um, you have any questions you want to open up for q &A? you have any questions? Let's shoot, let's take some time. for a bit there. How about now? Good. If you have any questions, raise your hand. Hi, my name is Cynthia. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was very lovely and wonderful. Um, what books do you recommend to read? I have a son and a daughter, they're three and four, and I'm teaching them our culture. It's the only problem is that dad um, is black, he's, but he's African-American um, and he's from Detroit, but we don't know his, he doesn't know like his culture of like his ancestors. And so is there um, a book that can tell us more about our history, at least the um, African-American history and the black community history? Is there books that you recommend to One read? One more time for the English. <laughs> oh, me? Um, do you have any books to, um, what books do you recommend to read? Let me put it short. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Not hearing anything. Um, oh, so somebody's asking about book recommendations. I heard you. I mentioned, I mentioned some articles uh, I would certainly um, recommend Ted Vincent's book, The Legacy of Vicente Guerrero, Mexico's First Black Indian President. I would recommend that. I also mentioned, there's another interesting book by Arnaldo de Leon, and the title of it is They Called Them Greasers. They call them greasers. And there's an interesting chapter, uh, Disloyalty and Subversion, where he goes into great detail about the extent to which Tejanos aided 
runaway slaves. Um, I also mentioned, um, you can find, uh, you can, well, you might find some references to it online, but you can, that's, a, that's an interesting book to get. Um, I would also recommend the article Across the Rio to Freedom, U.S. Negroes in Mexico by Rosalie Swartz, which uh, is a really interesting piece on the extent to which uh, runaways uh, found safe haven in uh, Mexico during slavery. Okay. Uh, we got um, Dawson Hill and then Adrian Clay. And before that, let me just mention a couple of other quick articles. Uh, when Mexico was a threat to Major League Baseball, it's by Evan Weiner. It's online. And also the secret history of how Mexico pushed baseball toward racial integration by Cesar Gonzalez. I would, those would be good articles. And then I've written a few articles. If you look, put my name in uh, Black Brown, you'll find, uh, you'll find a few articles that I've written. So a couple, couple questions, just two. Um, you know how people come, change, go to different countries, or like I, li I grew up in Puerto Rico and mm -hmm. you know, Puerto, Puerto Rican. So I'm I'm wondering, growing up in New York. And Puerto Ricans, you know, speak Spanish, Me Mexicans speak Spanish, but it's always a little different. So my first question is when Africans first came to Mexico, and then as time went on, as you went and visit, vi visited people in Afro-Mexican, or I think you called it Showtown, I'm wondering if the dialect is a little different, my first question. And I wonder, second question, I wonder, I have a lot of really dark friends from Panama, but they, they migrated from Jamaica, West Indies. I wonder if you have any connection or have any information about that. Well, I'm trying to deal with your first question. Um, you talked about when, Me when the Africans came to Mexico. You know, 15, right. 1521 to 1821 is when there was slavery under the Spanish, 300 years. So slavery began and ended in Mexico under Spanish rule before it began and ended in the United States. Um, it's also interesting, I was looking at some, some research recently, so I'm looking at some DNA, which pointed out that every Mexican has in their blood some trace of African blood Sub-Saharan African blood. I was looking at some, some, some research recently that pointed that out. That is why when we see many Mexican people, they're dark. They are with various shades. I got one image I did. We didn't put up here. Got a uh, a Mexican guitarist in Quahini Quilapa there in Guerrero, and he's he's uh, he's dark as Rob, and he's on a guitar and he's got. He's, his, his clothing, his hat, everything is what you is what's typical of Mexican culture. And I've been to Panama. Um, you had that second question had to do with Panama. Right. Um, I was there a week before under Bush, the US invaded Panama. Um, mm. And I was there on, they got a Central Avenue in Panama City, just like Central Avenue here in LA. Wow. Uh, we went there, we were invited by Noriega, who was very shaky. Noriega did wacko stuff. But one of the interesting things, and he, he was the power behind the Francisco Rodriguez government, but he had at the head table were all these black people. He developed housing for blacks and a lot of the stuff, I'm getting kind of off your point. But uh, anyway, these were things that were happening there with Noriega. Thank you. Sure, thank you and thanks for listening. Adrian. 
No sound. I, w I didn't see the globe to choose any language or anything. I'm. Uh, you, you have to choose. You have to choose your uh, language channel. Uh, We're not hearing. We're not hearing. Adrian, you 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 gotta be in the uh, in the English channel. Yeah, I'm on my cell phone. I don't know how to do that. Oh, it sounds like you got a lot of feedback uh, on your phone, Adrian. Uh, type your question in the chat. Thank you. You mean, yeah, I'm sorry. Type your question in the chat, Adrian. Other questions? It's kind of warm in here. Go ahead, Ed. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah. Oh, I, ha I have to unmute. <clears throat> yeah, Ron. Yes. When we um, speak of Mexico at the Alamo in Mexico, also inviting blacks in. The Afro-Mexicans are still a part of Mexico then, right? So they're part of the Mexican troops inviting the black Americans in, as well as fighting the French, right? Um, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Because sometimes it seems like they disappeared and then they pop back up. So I, I just wanted to make it clear that they're also a part of that population. Thanks. You're making a good point there. You make a good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But we're numerically smaller, but we still are there in considerable numbers, especially if you go to some of the, they have uh, an encuentro every year because the villages are isolated and poor, mm -hmm. where they come together. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a, a host village and people from all the other villages come and they bring out all the cultural stuff and mm -hmm. so on, and they talk about how to put pressure on the government of Mexico to give them more resources to improve their school system and that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, I know they had one, I believe in Coahuila this past year. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I haven't been in a few years because Mexico has gotten so dangerous. Mm -hmm. I lived in Belize for a while and I would drive, I drove to from LA through Mexico to Belize about three different times. Mm -hmm. And they got all these people on the highway. They're not always police and troops, but they, they're well armed and they want money. And uh, you know, you're not gonna just take my money. And so eventually, you know, I'm 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 worried that they'll just kill me and roll me off in a ditch somewhere. So I haven't been in a while. Yeah, I I was there in November. And I won't drive, but I took the bus. The bus is real nice. I picked the luxury bus. And I've never had a problem. Mm -hmm. And I, I visited some friends down there in uh, Durango. Okay. Yeah, but driving myself, I won't do that. But on the bus, it, it's pretty safe. Yeah, one of the last times I went, the guy was demanding money. And I started giving him this history. And I was pulling out my, my material and showing him the pictures and stuff. And he forgot all about trying to take my money because he was so into learning the history. <laughs> I'm going to carry some books with me. <laughs> yes. Someone asked uh, if there are some children's books that you would recommend. Yeah, I've done a, I've done a children's book. Where is that? You have it on the thing? You've got to go back and find it. Um, but it's, uh, what is it? Black and Mexican history. No, black and brown history. Black and Brown Unity, an Illustrated History for Beginners. It's in both English and Spanish. And I have, I have the book, yes. He's trying to find the, uh, there it is. Not, not there, that's not that's it. Not no, no, sir. 
It's the one with the two little girls on the front. Oh, that one. This one, this is my book here. Those two little girls, by the way, this is, uh, <laughs> uh, why can't I call her name? Uh, this is Iri and this is Nydia. And Nydia, the, the, the black girl is actually the aunt of the other girl. They were six years old in this picture. Let's take one more question. We didn't hear the sister over here. Did oh, Adrian, did you put your, did, did she put her question? If Adrian is there, we can get, hear you, it'd be great. No, she, she's okay. She said she's gonna type it out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, it's in the, it's in the chat. Okay. Have we got you? Thanks for your patience, all of you. You're an incredible audience. Because I know I just rambled on and on about this stuff. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh... Let me put this up too. This is another thing. Hey, how you like this one? Can they see it right the right way where they are? So look. If I'm hanging from the tree with you, how I'm going to squabble with you? Me and you need to figure out how to get down from the tree and go attack who put us on the sign. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Whatever your question is, we'll get it answered. Um, but we want to, uh, we're going to close out. We want to thank everyone for being here. We want to thank um, uh, Professor Wilkins. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate your brother. Appreciate you too. <laughs> well, I, have, I have one quick question, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, there's a book by Marco Hernandez. The African Mexicans and the discourse on mo the modern nation. Okay, I don't know the book. I don't know the person. No, I don't know the book. Okay, then. Well, he talks about the culture of Mexico and the African elements like menudo and rice that Africans brought there that gets attributed to the Spanish. But he breaks down a bunch of other stuff too. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great job. Thank you. Thank you all. Hold on, let me go back. Thank you all for participating. Um, thank you all for signing in. Uh, running, running mad. Hola, hola, hola. Hola, hola. Hola, Estoy bien emocionada de todo lo que dijeron hoy en este día. Oh, Rita's talking. No tenía la. No tenía. Todo la, el conocimiento de saber de todo lo de, de México, Estados Unidos y todos los afroamericanos que somos hermanos. Hermanos de veras, somos hermanos. Gracias. Yes, yes. Ah, somos hermanos. And let me just say something. Remember, celebrate the holidays. February 14th, remember? Remember, um, remember March 6th, 1836. Remember that with the Alamo? Another important one is June 25th. June 25th, 1876. One of my heroes, Chief Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, and others, they wiped out Custer. And the seventh Calvary, and minutes minutes oh, okay. you didn't hear me? 
I was saying, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I was saying, remember to celebrate the holidays, okay? February 14th, to celebrate Guerrero, remember him, even though that was the day he was executed. Remember March 6th, the day the Alamo fell, Davy Crockett and, and uh, what all them people, uh, Jim Bowie and William Travis, all them wiped out, okay? And also I was saying, remember June 25th, I didn't mention this, I went to Little Bighorn up in Montana, because I love one of my heroes is Chief Crazy Horse. Chief Crazy Horse and the Sitting Bull. In 20 minutes time, they wiped out Custer and the Seventh Cavalry. All they left alive on that hill was a horse. And what the US Army would do when they would remember uh, Little Bighorn is they would parade, have a, a horse with a saddle with no man in it to remember it. But these are days we need to be celebrating because these were big victories for, for us and our people. Okay? They had a black man actually ride with uh, Custer. His name was Isaiah Dorman. There's an interesting book called Custer's Black White Man. And it's about Isaiah Dorman. He's a former slave and he had gotten uh, real close to the Sioux and others, but he secretly rode with Custer. His body was the most mutilated body on the battlefield. Everywhere you could put an arrow above the waist was an arrow. Everywhere a bullet below the waist was a bullet. They even cut his testicles and stuffed it, stuffed them in his mouth to show the ultimate contempt for a traitor. But these are history lessons that we need to know and have. But thank you. Nice. Nice. Woo. Hey, how, how do we stop? We, 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 <laughs> we can't stop. <laughs> so thank you all again. Yeah, you all are great people. Really appreciate you. Appreciate you. Um, uh, Hey, it, it, it's been a blast. This, this has been uh, our way of commemorating and, and paying homage to Black History Month by showing and paying homage to our communities, uh, especially here in South LA, by showing some history that most of us don't even know, 99% of us don't even know this history um, of, of our solidarity throughout these centuries. So thank you for participating. Thank you for staying on. I know I know it's late. Uh, get some rest, feed the kitties, and uh, peace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. All right. Forward, onward. Gracias, Hasta luego. Gracias. Feliz noche para todos. Hasta mañana. Gracias. Hasta luego. Gracias. Buenas noches. Have a good bye evening. Bye. Thank you for the wonderful okay. history. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to show you some pictures right over there, the wife. Mm -hmm. Okay. So small pictures. Mm -hmm. Let me fire this thing up real quick. Okay. Let me use the Russian. Okay. I need to go too. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. Yeah. It's late where Pilar is, like she's out. I'm gonna go ahead of you. I know where it's at. Okay. Amino. Amino. Man. Great job, Rona. Gloria. You guys did a wonderful job. This was so good. I can't hear. Hold on. Go ahead, say that again. I said, this was so great. I was just like, I don't want to leave. Oh, Can y'all continue? <laughs> right. <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I'm going to turn his off. I hope you enjoyed it, Gloria. Oh, I did. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. More. We got to have more. 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 His <laughs> side won't let me leave. I'm trying to leave. <laughs> <laughs>